Good evening, everyone. Hi, I'm Matthew Ozanik with WCMU Public Media, and I want to welcome all of you to tonight's program, Hemingway in Michigan. Thank you for joining us, as this evening we're going to be taking a look at a very pivotal uh, time in uh, one of America's, one of the 20th century's uh, greatest authors, uh, Ernest Hemingway. As a boy, Ernest Hemingway and his family would spend uh, summers in their Walloon Lakeside cabin, Windermere. And those experiences that were had by Ernest Hemingway had a tremendous effect on the man as well as his writings. In a few moments, I'll be joined by Frank Bowles, director of the Clark Historical Library at Central Michigan University, and Michael Federspiel, historian and author of Picturing Hemingway's Michigan. Together, Frank and Michael have amassed one of the nation's most robust Hemingway collections that include family scrapbooks and letters written by a young Ernest Hemingway uh, while in northern Michigan. A little bit later on this evening, I'll be joined by Lynn Novick and Sarah Botstein, two of the filmmakers behind Hemingway, premiering April 5th on PBS. And we'll also be taking an advanced look at some of the excerpts from the program. Plus, Lynn and Sarah will be taking questions from you, our audience, so if you have any questions for our guests this evening, please feel free to add them to the question and answer part of the chat. But first, I'd like to now bring in Frank Bowles and Michael Federspiel. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having us. It's a pleasure. All right, Frank, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. Uh, the Clark Historical Library's Hemingway Collection, like I said, is incredibly robust, one of the most complete uh, collections that you're going to be able to find anywhere. Uh, for starters, could you give us a little bit of background? How did the Hemingway Collection at the Clark Historical Library get its start, and uh, what are the kind of items we can find in that? About 20 years ago now, Mike Federspiel came into my office and he himself collected Hemingway material about Hemingway's time in Michigan, but he was also representing an organization, the Michigan Hemingway Society, which was very interested in Hemingway in Michigan. And he had a simple idea. He said, no one's really documenting this. Can the Clark take on that responsibility? And I was excited and I was scared. Uh, we did not have any literary collections really to speak of. And we weren't going to start with some sort of small time local author. We were going to start with a Nobel laureate, you know, go to the top of the mountain first. But after some conversations here at CMU, some conversations with the then Dean of Libraries, Tom Moore, because this could involve some money, uh, we decided to go forward. Uh, what's in the collection today is a wealth of material. There's material by and about Ernest Hemingway. Um, the about material, which is in many ways very exciting, the most important are a set of scrapbooks that Ernest Hemingway's mother put together. Ernest Hemingway's mother documented her summer, her children's summer experiences. Every child got a scrapbook. We have scrapbooks of Ernest's elder sis, eldest sister, his, the firstborn in the family, Marceline Hemingway. And these are wonderful. These are multi-volume scrapbooks. And they're not only pictures, they're annotated. Dr. Uh, Ernest's father was an amateur photographer of considerable talent, so these are good pictures. In addition to that kind of material and, and various other subsidiary material, we have things written by Ernest Hemingway himself. We have a wonderful letter, for example, trying to persuade a friend to move the to come to Michigan for the summer. We have postcards. Po we have a postcard from Italy during World War I where he writes back home, and he's writing to a friend's... Um, a, a, a cottage place that, that sold chicken dinners to the tourists. And he says, I'm looking forward to getting home and having a good chicken dinner. I mean, this is the kind of things you find here, just wonderful documentation, but just very personal stories. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, and in addition to tonight's event, Hemingway in Michigan, we here at WCMU Public Media have produced uh, several installments of a web series that we do called Let's Go Back, Stories from the Clark Historical Library. Uh, and we've produced several of those that uh, feature the Hemingway collection and tell a lot about the story of Ernest Hemingway in Michigan. And so right now we're going to go ahead and roll a clip, a little bit of a teaser a trailer for the Let's Go Back web series. Let's go. There's only a few major Hemingway collections in the United States. One of them is here at Central Michigan University. The thrill of some of this is that you hold a letter that Ernest Hemingway wrote, you hold a scrapbook that Ernest Hemingway's mother put together that has pictures taken by Ernest Hemingway's father of the kids in a rowboat or splashing in the lake. This is all sort of this wonderful package that tells you what it was like for this young man to grow up in Northern Michigan and then to go on and become a major literary figure in the world. 
We think of Ernest Hemingway as a Nobel laureate. They thought of him as, as Dr. Hemingway's kid. And in many ways see that the Hemingway's experience was just another family up north. He hunted, he fished, and most of anything, he hung out with his friends. He was just a kid. Somehow this kid became the person that we know as Ernest Hemingway, Nobel laureate. Michigan became the subject matter of his earliest, and some might argue even the best writing that he did. He found his style through his Nick Adams stories. That bay, that lake never really left him. He always had the same fascinations. Ernest Hemingway could take what he was experiencing, what he was feeling, what he was internalizing, and change that into art. And again, you can find that entire series online at WCMU.org or on the WCMU Public Media YouTube channel. And now I want to bring into the conversation Mike Fetterspiel. Uh, Mike, in that uh, video we just saw, we were able to see a lot of the photos that, are, uh, that live inside the Clark's Hemingway collection. Uh, and you heard you talk a little bit about uh, Hemingway and the family and their time in northern Michigan. I'm kind of wondering, uh, for starters, can you kind of set the stage for us? What does Hemingway's Michigan, northern Michigan at the turn of the 20th century, uh, what does that look like? And what would Ernest and his family members uh, have been doing? Well, they would have been, maybe not surprisingly, doing an awful lot of the same things that we all do when we go up north in the summertime. Uh, they would have fished, they would have hung out in the water, they would have teased their brothers and sisters, they would have gone for boat rides. Uh, it's remarkable the number of activities that are so similar 100 plus years later. But the Hemingways, when they first came um, in 1898, they were so impressed with the area that they bought land on Walloon Lake. And in 1899, they brought their six-week-old son, Ernest, up when they sighted the location where their cottage would be. And a 40 by 20, very rustic cottage with tossed out with, with hand-me-down furniture in it. Uh, and then they would continue to use that cottage right up uh, through, well, today. The cottage actually is privately owned, but it's still in the family. Um, the Hemingways would uh, take a train or a steamship to get to northern Michigan, come up after the school year got out, and quite often not go back until school started in the fall. Um, but the family would do that, and then Ernest, after the First World War, would come back and spend time, and even eventually getting married here in 1921, he would come to own the family cottage, Windermere, uh, uh, starting in the 1930s, and he would own that until his death in 1961. So it really was a lifelong connection in one way or another with northern Michigan. Mm -hmm. And obviously, yes, the Hemingway and the Hemingway family spend lots of time in northern Michigan uh, throughout 1899 to 1919. But really that year, 1919, uh, let's talk about that year, especially with uh, Ernest Hemingway. That was really, Ernest Hemingway at that point in his life was really at a crossroads. Uh, his life had, you know, he was uh, war torn, he was heartbroken, and uh, he came to northern Michigan uh, to find solace. Can you talk a little bit about that summer that we, that he spent in northern Michigan and what we know about that? Yeah, it, it really was a, a crossroads, a before and after. Uh, it's, it's accurate to say that really up until that point, uh, until 1919, that he was a boy, he was a son, he was a brother, he wasn't a, a man. Uh, he graduated high school in 1917, went off in 1918 uh, and joined the Red Cross as an ambulance driver in Italy, uh, was in the wrong place at the wrong time, ended up with wounds from mortar shell and machine gun fire, recuperated in a Milan hospital that fall, came back in January of 1919, uh, and a poster child for post-traumatic stress. He was a mess. He was almost lost his life, let alone his legs, um, was at wit's end, two years out of high school, didn't know what he was gonna do for a living. The one thing he held on to was the love of the Red Cross nurse, uh, Agnes. Agnes and he planned to get married, he thought, uh, and then in March of that year, she dumped him, uh, spiraling him deeper down into depression and, and uh, sadness and confusion. And so 1919, he devotes to trying to make everything make sense and put the world back into its rightful place. He writes uh, letters to friends from the Red Cross, from his hometown of Oak Park, from Kansas City, where he worked as a reporter in 1918, inviting them to come to beautiful northern Michigan, he extolled the beauties and the opportunities up north. And then when fall came, his parents kind of wondering if it's college time, he decided instead to become a writer. 
And so in the fall of 1919, he moved into a boarding house in Petoskey. He lived there through that fall and into the early winter and began to try to really seriously write fiction. And he would not really strike it rich or, or strike it successfully until he was after he was married in 1920 when I went to Paris. But what he did when he got to Paris was he wrote about what he knew. That had been advice that he had been given and it's advice that he took to heart. And so in 1921 and in the 20s largely, he wrote a series of short stories and, and, um, and even a novel set in Northern Michigan and the, the Nick Adams stories portray exotic places. He's in, he's in Paris, City of Light, with uh, Pablo Picasso and Gertrude Stein and S. Scott Fitzgerald. And he's writing about Mancelona and Kalkaska and Horton Bay and Petoskey. And so that 1919 is when he transitions from that boy on the verge of manhood, and then he becomes a man and his own man at that time. Yeah, and obviously, you know, uh, when we talk about Ernest Hemingway, uh, going back a little bit, talking about his family, uh, early in his life, obviously this is a time in his life that isn't talking about uh, incredibly a, a, a lot. Um, I think of most people, when they have a picture of Ernest Hemingway, it's the white hair, it's the white beard, it's the Papa Hemingway. But And, and talking with the both of you, it's kind of, the one thing that I, I remember you guys always say is that, you know, Nobody knew who Hemingway was, and this was kind of like a, a tiny moment before he got that worldwide fame. Frank, when we look through those scrapbooks and we see this family that could be any family uh, in, in northern Michigan, what do we learn about uh, their experiences? How unique uh, was their, was the, were the Hemingway family experience, and how also how ununique was it? Amazingly, it's like, as Mike has already said, this looks like any family fortunate enough to own a cottage in northern Michigan. They swim, they, they, they do hot dogs on, on the grill, they, they put marshmallows on sticks. They do all the things we still do. So in that respect, they are absolutely normal. It's what everyone still experiences in northern Michigan when they go up north. Where they're different is that this family has a, a very unique background. Um, Ernest Hemingway's father was an obstetrician. He loved nature. He loved the outdoors. He taught Ernest Hemingway to watch carefully. He taught Ernest Hemingway the joys of hunting and fishing, and Ernest Hemingway adored his father. Ernest Hemingway's relationship with his mother was much more complex. His mother was trained to be an opera singer, actually was on the verge of a premiere in New York City, gave up that career to come back to Oak Park, Illinois, suburban Chicago, marry Clarence Hemingway and raise the children. She was extremely artistic. She was a talented singer herself, a talented choral leader. She actually made more money for the family with these skills than her husband, the doctor, did. And she wasn't hesitant to remind the family of that. Um, she was, Ernest Hemingway would portray her very uncharitably throughout his life. He didn't like his mother. He was mad at his mother. He found her domineering. He blamed his mother for his father's death. His father had committed suicide. At the same time, he does all this stuff and he has all this anger. After his father's suicide, his mother has really a real problem with income. The nurse Hemingway sets up a trust fund out of the money he's making from these major novels he's writing to take care of his mother for the rest of his life. Is this a dutiful son? Is this an angry child? What's going on here? This is a very complicated complex relationship uh, definitely a complex relationship uh, but it from the books that have been written by the Hemingway family and of course the Nick Adams stories uh, it is no question that the Hemingway's time in northern Michigan uh, had a tremendous impact on his life and all of their lives uh, Michael when you look at Hemingway's life after he left uh, northern Michigan, where do you see the impacts from that time, that childhood, on his future writings and where he would go on in the world? Well, I, I think Michigan provided a deep well of memories and impressions for him that he drew on for the rest of his life, primarily in the 1920s when he started writing short stories and he created a character uh, by the name of Nick Adams. And there were uh, dozens of stories that featured this Nick Adams uh, young man a young boy and as a teenager and then as an older man with children of his own. 
He just happened to have a father who was a doctor, Nick Adams, had a mother who was the lower bearing, he had little sisters, he hung out in Petoskey in the area, and he encountered life. This young man who thought he knew what life was all about only to experience something that taught him something new. And so those are probably the most pronounced places you see Michigan's influence on Hemingway. But those who, who know Hemingway's life will find references to it uh, throughout his writings for the rest of his life and right up to the end when he wrote um, a book of vignettes of what it was like to live in Paris in the 1920s called A Movable Feast. And he talked very poetically about what it was like to sit in a cafe and to write, in essence, the story of the Big Two-Hearted River and what it was like to take himself back in terms of his memories to that stream in northern Michigan. So he may not have lived in northern Michigan. He visited only once that we know of in the 40s. And then he didn't. He came to Petoskey. He looked up old Petoskey friends. But when they asked if he wanted to go out to his cottage, Windermere, he said, no, I, I don't want to destroy the memory I have of it. He had made the mistake, he thought, of going back to the battlefield where he was wounded in the First World War in Italy after the war, and he was so disturbed at how different it was from his memory, he just simply didn't want to do that with that northern Michigan that he held you know, deep in his, in his memory and in his heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know Michael and Frank, uh, both of you have been fortunate enough to visit uh, Windermere on Walloon Lake. Uh, give us a little bit of an, of an idea. What kind of impression did uh, spending time at Windermere uh, give you? Give us kind of a description of, of what that experience was like. Uh, Frank, we can start with you. Well, Windermere itself is, is a beautiful setting. It is indeed a cottage on Walloon Lake, lake frontage. Beautiful site, sandy beach. You can see why the Hemingway has picked this for their children. It would be a great place to swim and play. But one has to be realistic a little bit. When we say uh, the Hemingway summer home, the Hemingway, the Hemingway summer home when it was constructed at the turn of the 20th century was a 20 by 40 foot building with, with two bedrooms, a fireplace for some heat, and an outhouse out back. This is not some grand cottage that some millionaire has constructed. It's a pretty modest place. They'll do a little addition as time goes on, but it's always going to be really a summer home and a, and a summer cottage in a very traditional sense. It's not a home in the sense of a all season home on the lake. So that, that would be one of the things I would take away from the cottage, Mike. Well, and, and I would recall uh, an American literature class I had at CMU and a professor, when we read some Hemingway, kind of wink at us and say, you know, if you're nice to me, I may take you up north to see the Hemingway estate. And, and it conjured up big high walls and a compound, you know, with turrets and, and such. Um, and little did I know, years later, when I finally did go there, it, is, it was as Frank described. And when the Hemingways built it, they bought 200 foot of frontage from a farmer. The farmer, it was just open field and the farmer's cattle came down and, and drank out of the lake. They put up a rustic fence out back to keep the cattle out, but it was it was the first generation of cottagers. There were people who went to Petoskey in the area for an overnight or so, just kind of tourists. There were some that went to compounds like Bayview and Week Batonsing, but the Hemingways were among the first that actually had their own place, and that place was very modest. It remains modest, um, and for those of us who appreciate Hemingway's literary talents, at both that and his personal life, it's, it's kind of a shrine, but, but I would uh, say again, there, there's, there are beautiful, large homes that are all around Walloon Lake. It's a gorgeous lake, justifiably having these places. Mm -hmm. But the Hemingway place looks like a cottage. And I, I'm sure it smelled like a cottage when they opened it up in the spring and then they boarded up the windows in the fall. And it was a cottage and remains a very nice cottage, but, but certainly is not the, the um, elaborate homes that you'll find elsewhere around that lake. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we know, too, we've spoken that Ernest Hemingway spent a good portion of time in Petoskey. Mike, if someone were to visit uh, the city of Petoskey, right on Lake Michigan, uh, and they wanted to, say, walk in the footsteps of Ernest Hemingway, uh, what kind of places would they go? What kind of places are around there that are still accessible uh, that people could get a little Hemingway experience? Yeah, I, I'd say a couple of things. The first stop I would direct them to is the Little Traverse History Museum which is located in the um, old Jermarquette train depot on the waterfront. They have a permanent Hemingway display there that is first rate, uh, contains artifacts from the family, signed editions. 
uh, and the people there are very knowledgeable about Hemingway. So I'd say do that first. The second thing I would do is to say that people should probably think about getting in touch with the Michigan Hemingway Society. The society has been around probably close to 30 years now and holds, well, held annual conferences in Petoskey and those often, if not always, contain some kind of local tour. There is also a signposted tour, a My Hemingway Place tour, and there are brochures available uh, through the Convention Bureau, and I believe that website is still up with about 20 different Hemingway locations, not only in Petoskey itself, but also out at Horton Bay and other locations that were that are still there. And, and I guess that's one of the things I would say too, there are an awful lot of pilgrims that go north to see Hemingway spots. Most authors' places that they lived and wrote about are gone. You know, they've simply evolved and changed and they are no more. And in Hemingway's case, you can go to Horton Bay and you can see that same wooden framed uh, store that he wrote about, Horton Bay General Store. You can see the house where his wedding reception was held. You can walk down to the dock at Horton Bay where stories are set. So I certainly would encourage people to uh, take a look at the Michigan Hemingway Society and also take a look at that uh, display at the Little Traverse History Museum. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been to the Tra Little Traverse Bay History Museum. It's a tremendous place. Uh, we did get one question in uh, so far on our Zoom Q&A uh, asking if did Hemingway first marry a woman from Horton Bay? I think we should clarify that she was not from Horton Bay, but they got married in Horton Bay, correct? Yeah, a real interesting story. You have um, Ernest, who's from upper middle class, very proper, you know, church wedding, big wedding, society events, uh, Oak Park. And you have uh, Hadley Richardson, who's from St. Louis, whose parents had died, but she also comes from a setting where there would have been a, a, a more formal wedding expected. And so what does Hemingway, what do Hemingway and Hadley decide? They're gonna get married at Horton Bay. And so indeed they do. They have a cluster of friends that come around. They, there's a church that wasn't being used anymore and they get permission to use that. Hemingway writes a friend saying, find me a preacher because we need somebody to conduct the service. So the service is held. There's a chicken dinner after the service, and then Hemingway will row his new bride across Walloon Lake to the family cottage, and um, that's where they will spend a honeymoon suffering from colds, and they pulled the mattress out in front of the fireplace because it was so cold in September of 1921 when they got married. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and so we've talked so far uh, this evening a lot about Hemingway and the influence that Michigan had uh, with him. But before we get into our first clip of Hemingway, the documentary, the film by uh, Ken Burns and Lynn Novak that premieres April 5th on PBS, um, I want to go back to the Clark Library collection. Uh, Frank, I remember you saying uh, to me a while ago that the most important thing about this collection is not simply to have it, but to share it. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how the Hemingway collection at the Clark is used and in fact was used uh, for, for with Florentine films? Sure. There's an old joke among special collections librarians and archivists. When someone comes in, they're often amazed by what you can present to them. And they say, well, why did you do all this? And the answer is because we built it for you. And in a way, we built this collection for Florentine films. We built this collection for people who wanted to document the life of Ernest Hemingway in Michigan. Uh, Florentine Films was a very intensive user of the collection. We were in contact with them for two years. This was not a once and done sort of event. Uh, when we were first contacted by the staff, we pointed them at first to some online resources we have. Uh, if you look at the CMU Library's digital collections, you'll find most of those scrapbooks that we've been discussing about have been digitized. They're there, you can see them. But we also have some other resources that are not online. In the end, we probably sent them several hundred images. They then came back to us and eventually 50 or 60 high resolution images were sent to them. The things we have online right now are not broadcast quality. They needed much better resolution. So we made that possible. And it was an iterative process. They would say, okay, that's a great picture. Do you have anything more like that? And we said, well, yeah, and we, how about this? Uh, this came down to a final question, which Mike will remember well, because he was involved in this final question. We got a sort of last minute communication saying, we need a picture of Horton Bay. Do you have one? And we went, uh, not in the Hemingway collection proper, but after a day of hunting around, 
and this shows you the importance of the colleagues and, and friends we work with, we found that picture in a publication of the Michigan Hemingway Society. And we were able to make copy of that picture at the sufficient resolution for the documentary filmmakers and get that to them. So it was a, it was a back and forth, but it, it's what we do in reference. It's what's so important about a special collections library that we have the time and the ability to help people like Florentine Films. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, before we get into that first uh, clip from the new Hemingway documentary, we do have a couple more questions uh, from our audience that I wanted to be able to ask. Uh, the first question is, are tours given at Windermere? And from what I've gathered, it's a place that's not open to the public. Is that correct? Yeah, and, and it really is. And it's, it, it's, a, it's, it can be awkward. It, it is a, a family cottage, and it's used as such. And yet it is such a touchstone for so many people. Its, it's location is not publicized. Uh, it is open, has been open in the past occasionally for uh, nonprofit fundraising events hosted by the uh, gentleman who owned it. And, but it was by invitation only. And uh, certainly the Michigan Hemingway Society group and, and Hemingway supporters in that area uh, tell people it's not open. It's, it's uh, you should stay off the property. It's okay to drive by on the road, but it's not a place uh, that is open, there's no parking, it's it's highly residential area, and um, what you need to do is go to the Clark and look at some terrific pictures of it, as opposed to actually go into it at this point. Yeah, I think the family would appreciate that. <laughs> or go online and uh, peruse the, the collection as well. And also, right. uh, real quick, we have another question from uh, uh, Hillary, hello from New Hampshire. Uh, is the railroad bridge Nick Adams stood on real, and is it still there? Um, yes and yes. If you go to uh, Sini, Michigan, um, Sini is about as big as Hemingway described it in the Big Two-Hearted River. And there is the railroad bridge there and the pilings are there that you can see. Uh, and he nailed it pretty hard. And it's, it's interesting too, because in the Big Two-Hearted River, um, Hemingway fishes alone or Nick Adams fishes alone. But Frank knows from the Clark's collection that there was a fishing trip in August of 1919 when Hemingway went with two buddies and they fished the Fox River, which is at Sini. And we know this because the Clark has a postcard that Ernest sent to his father boasting about the catches that they had made. Uh, so Sini is there, the Fox River is there. There is a two-hearted river down the road a bit. Hemingway used that name because he thought it sounded like pure poetry, more so than the Fox. But yes, indeed, that railroad bridge is indeed still there at Sini. All righty. Well, thank you very much. Michael Federspiel, author and historian and author of Picturing Hemingway's Michigan, and Frank Bowles, director of the Clark Historical Library right here on the campus of Central Michigan University. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Again, Hemingway on PBS premieres this Monday, April 5th at 8 p.m. Uh, if you're in Michigan, WCMU, but if not, check your local listings for your local PBS channel. Uh, now I will be joined by uh, two of the filmmakers, uh, director Lynn Novick and producer Sarah Botstein. Lynn, Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you for having us. Absolutely. Okay, Lynn, I'd like to start with you. We just uh, had a very nice conversation with Michael Federspiel and Frank Bowles of the Clark Historical Library. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your uh, experiences with both Michael and Frank at the Clark Historical Library and how they were able to help you guys in this production? Yeah, so um, first, I just want to say that, you know, we understand and we knew from the beginning how important Northern Michigan is to Hemingway's life and his work. So we knew we would be focusing a lot of our efforts um, with the resources there. And, you know, I was able to come to Michigan and Michael very generously spent a day showing me the places that were important to Hemingway. And that was incredibly meaningful. It felt all of a sudden touching reality of Hemingway's world by being there. I'm very grateful for that. And Frank Bowles and the library helped our staff. Um, our associate producer, Jonah Velasco, especially was in constant contact with him and the staff there to find out more about the treasures of the Hemingway collection, um, to go beyond what's online, as he said, and to find ways that we could tell the story of Hemingway's life in Michigan through the collection there. And especially when COVID happened, we were a bit panicked because um, we had been uh, you know, given sort of research materials, but now we needed high resolution scans and they very graciously helped us find a way to get access to the materials we needed to finish the film, which was not a foregone conclusion last March. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Talking about the film Hemingway, you know, 2021 marks 60 years since the passing of Ernest Hemingway. Uh, I guess to start off, my question would be, uh, why Hemingway and why now uh, cover this uh, man's life? Sarah? Well, um we didn't set out to make a film about Hemingway that aired in 2021. When I first uh, came to work with Ken and Lynn, I went to um, a kind of senior staff meeting where everyone was talking about what films might be of interest. And that was 1997 or 1998, I think. And I guess Hemingway had been in the back of Ken's mind for a long time. Jeff Ward had always been interested in exploring another writer. And Lynn had recently come back from a very profound, we now understand, trip to Key West where she um, visited the Hemingway house and just had kind of, as she would say, an aha moment that she wanted to learn more about this famous writer that she'd read and revered as a young reader, bought some biographies in the gift shop, uh, read them voraciously and, you know, put her... Um, hand down to say she wanted to do Hemingway. And actually, for a number of reasons and other projects that we did, it took us a while to get the project off the ground to decide to really do it. And while we were making our Vietnam series, we, which was six and a half, seven years ago, in the midst of that production, really set out and went and met with the family and interviewed. Lynn did two extraordinary interviews with Patrick Hemingway, went to the Hemingway collection and um, you know, it's um, it's an interesting time to be talking about Hemingway, to have um, a conversation about not only his life, but his work. And we're happy to be here and grateful to Michigan. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of Michigan, obviously, you know, this is a, a man who went all around the world. Um, but when you look at the time that Ernest Hemingway spent as a youth in Michigan. Did it change your opinion of him? I know we talk a lot about the myth of Hemingway. Was finding out more about his youth, were you able to kind of poke a few holes into that myth of Hemingway and maybe learn a little bit more about him? My, I mean, for myself, my first, you know, imagining of Hemingway's life in Michigan was through the Nick Adams stories. And he conjures up a world that I didn't realize was so real until we began to understand the time he spent in Michigan and how formative it was for him. And it really didn't become fully real until we saw the photographs that I understand his father took of the family and their life in Michigan. And that was just totally revelatory. And there's nothing mythic at all about it. This is just them in their world doing the stuff they do. And all of a sudden they became real people. Um, no one knows that this little boy is going to grow up to be Ernest Hemingway, you know. So, um, you know, it's a remarkable process that we get to go through when you start with something that's not really real and it becomes real. So, uh, Sarah, I'll pose this question to you. Uh, we got a question from a Mike Haynes in Berkeley, California, and he wanted to know what was the most surprising or most overlooked aspect or factoid of Hemingway's life you learned through your work on the film? That's a very hard question to answer. Um, I'll say two things. One is there are so many aspects of um, exploring biography that every, every day you learn something that you didn't know about a famous person who you have some perception of who they are. Um, so I think there were surprising things about both his life and his work. And in talk, and I think the Nick Adams stories and his early life are a perfect example of this constant interplay, as Lynn was saying, of what happened really in his life, how he uses those experiences, his observations around the experience he has, and then turns them into fiction. And there's a constant dance, and people have spent, you know, many, many thousands of hours trying to unpack who's Ernest Hemingway, who's Nick Adams, who did what, who was where, what's real, what's not real. And he's constantly, um, toying with the audience, you know, I think um, his hyper-masculine persona and his big game hunter, fisherman, ladies' man um, kind of exterior presence, I think, is much more complicated when you get to know him. And he's a much more anxious, insecure, uh, interested in sex, gender, romance in ways that um, I think are surprising, and we explore that in the film. Gotcha. Well, since I asked Sarah the tough question, Lynn, I guess I'll pose you the same question. Was there something about that you learned about Ernest Hemingway through this process that really surprised you that maybe you weren't expecting? 
Well, I mean, I think like Sarah, everything was, I did learn quite a lot. I didn't know that much about his personal story. I'd read a lot of his fiction before. Um, one of the things that just apropos of what we're talking about here tonight was his love of nature. You know, I knew he liked to hunt. Um, I knew he liked to fish and those things didn't interest me personally as much but his relationship to the natural world, which Sarah had a wonderful conversation with Ken and Terry Thomas Williams a few weeks ago, and I learned from that too, but just his relationship to nature and how that grounded him and how that he found sort of solace and, um, I don't know, just not an escape per se, but some kind of deeper meaning for someone who wasn't, I don't think a terribly spiritual person, um, you know, that was new. I didn't understand that. I knew a lot about bullfighting and, you know, World War One and kind of the big epic topics that he'd written about. But I, I had not fully understood how connected, pardon me, how connected he was to nature. That's a, his father. Mm -hmm. That's a great answer. And actually, when Lynn went to Michigan, and it was in October of, I don't know, six years ago, she sent me a bunch of iPhone pictures. And I have a great text from her saying it's just like every place you go when you're studying a subject that is important feels hyper important. And I think when you do go to the places where of the natural world where Hemingway was and then wrote about, it is um, really moving and profound. Since there's so many connections between Hemingway uh, in Michigan and Jeff Daniels, uh, how did you decide to bring him in to be the voice of not only Hemingway, but also his writings? Yeah, well, we knew we, we wanted to have one actor read both Hemingway's letters and um, personal correspondence, fiction and nonfiction. And uh, Jeff Daniels just seemed perfect for the part, frankly. And his connection to Michigan was not incidental, but not at the core of our attraction to him. Um, we wanted someone who could play Hemingway old and young, who could be, you know, every possible mood and have conversations with everyone he's talking to in those letters and then read some of the most beautiful writing uh, in American literature, as some of which you just heard. Um, and Jeff, you know, him being from Michigan, I, I think we hope there would be an affinity and interest and understanding of where Hemingway was coming from, perhaps. Um, that's about as far as it could really go. Uh, I'm not sure how deeply Jeff Daniels felt connected to Hemingway before by the time we finished the session of the several days of reading. Uh, it seemed pretty clear that Hemingway had gotten under his skin and he had gotten inside Hemingway in a really profound way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And of course, you know, uh, from looking at the previews for the uh, program that's coming out next week, uh, we learn a lot about uh, Hemingway and his marriages. And I was wondering if we could take just a moment to talk about uh, some of the other women in Hemingway's life, namely his mother uh, and his sisters, who obviously he spent a lot of time with uh, during his times in northern Michigan. Uh, what did you learn about their relationships and how the relationships with his mother and with his sisters uh, affected who, we, uh, who he was? Well, I think a lot's been made about this and Heming, you know, Hemingway's mother's influence on him. And clearly she had a profound influence on him, as do all most mothers on their children. Um, she was a tough, smart, disciplined um, person who was also from a time that Hemingway grew up in a very different world and a very different milieu from her. And I think the other children as well kind of railed against some of the Victorian um, ideals and rules that were set upon them. Um, that seems very, very true. But he had, you know, he was a man surrounded by a lot of women. He had many sisters. He had his mother um, and fell in love early in life. And I think women affected everything he did. Edna O'Brien says in the film that Hemingway um, loved to be in love and, um, Another person said that he wanted a new woman for every book or a new muse. So um, he has, you know, as you said, a lot has been made of the wives, but but uh, it does come from, I think, an influence of his um, mm -hmm. his strong mother and his strong sisters. Mm -hmm. He ultimately was not very nice to his mother. As we come to find out, yes. And, and we did, I uh, want to make sure we get to this, we did get a, a one question in our Q&A. A person acting ab uh, asking about a connection between Ernest Hemingway and Frank Lloyd Wright, noting uh, that they were both from Oak Park. Uh, can you talk a little bit about whether or not they had any sort of, what sort of connective tissue is there? Yeah, I, I, we, uh, Ken and I made a film about Frank Lloyd Wright, and so we spent a lot of time in Oak Park. And when you look at the Hemingway home, 
uh, it does, the one that they built, it does look a bit like a Frank Lloyd Wright house. And so, you know, maybe there's some kind of affinity there with this idea of this new American architecture being modern and kind of forward thinking um, in the way that they designed their home. I don't know of any particular connection. Probably somebody will correct me and maybe there was some. Frank Lloyd Wright left Oak Park in a scandal when Hemingway was pretty young. Um, and so he wasn't around Oak Park that much after that. That being said, I thought a lot about, you know, what influence did Oak Park have on Hemingway's life and career and perspective? And as Sarah was saying, you know, he was kind of running away from the rather conservative, somewhat Victorian values of his parents' generation mm -hmm. and rebelling against the rules that they set out about how one was supposed to behave. Mm -hmm. And a lot of his work was sort of well, it shocked them and they didn't like it, his early work, because they found it was, you know, impolite, improper and not something a gentleman would write. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he really wanted their approval and it caused a lot of conflict. But when you look at his work, Michigan is the place that seems the center of his literary imagination and the place that shaped him more. Mm -hmm. um, maybe because of the natural world or just the, the way he spent time there and what the family did and what he was exposed to. In Oak Park, it was probably a fairly constrained middle-class environment in, in Michigan from what he's written. We see that he's exposed to people from other classes, from uh, people who are Native Americans. I mean, he, he's just exposed to a whole, a many different worlds that seem to have made searing impression on him that he returned to again and again in his work. Let's go, I just had one thought I wanted to add, yes, which please. goes to what Lynn was just saying and the mother. I think the most surprising thing I learned was because his mother was an opera singer and a musician, she really instilled in him the sense of, particularly in Bach, the idea of repetition and counterpoint and some of the rhythms of Bach, which deeply influenced his writing and were one of the great um, surprises of making the film and one of the great challenges of editing to figure out which Bach to play, how it would fit with his writing and how to do that. And Lynn and I had an amazingly fun journey uh, with that. So that's a really interesting influence of his mother that I had not known. Okay, well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so in our last few minutes here, we're going to try to get to some of the questions we've received from our audience. Uh, one of them, um, I know we mentioned the big two-hearted river, but we have a viewer here who wants to know if any areas in Michigan's UP will be featured in the series. Michiganders love their Upper Peninsula. Yeah, um, sadly, the answer to that is no. Um, Michael was speaking earlier about the Big Two-Hearted River and where it's located and where Hemingway spent his time. And we know he did go to the UP, but you know there was a limit to how much we could cover. So unfortunately, we don't, we don't, we did not put him there in the narrative that we're telling. Absolutely. But it's, it's a story that could be told. Absolutely, absolutely. And we have a, a, another question. Uh, how is Hemingway still relevant today when there seems to be an attempt to undermine his importance was a, as a question that we got. But uh, how, yeah, how, how would you consider Hemingway still being relevant today in 2021? Well, I think that cuts to the heart of some of the themes in the film. From the little that we understand, Hemingway has gone in and out of fashion at different times um, in terms of how often he's taught and whether he deserves a place in what we loosely call the canon and should people read him or not read him. And, and that seems not quite generational, but it does seem to change um, over time. Having said that, I think the writers that we met with and writers that we interviewed who are of different ages, different genders and from around the world all say that he has um, a lasting influence on the craft of writing and um, is arguably one of the great writers of the 20th century. And um, we have to deal with him and his art, um, mm -hmm. whether he's in fashion or or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. It's really an important point. And I'm glad that you raised it because we are living in a time where, you know, the, there's a very you can be very reductive about who's in and who's out. And when you're talking about great art and complicated artists, it's just going to be more complicated. I was thinking as Sarah was talking, you know, would we say that we, there's so many artists about which we would have questions, whether they would meet our standards of what's acceptable behavior today. And so many would not. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we hope the film just sort of gives us room to have that conversation. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And another question that we got, uh, which you referenced to, uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier, asking about uh, what you think the influence of Native Americans had on Hemingway. Obviously, when he spent some time in northern Michigan, he was exposed to it. He wrote about them uh, a little bit in the Nick Adams stories. How do you feel his, his relationship with Native Americans and indigenous peoples uh, had an effect on him? I mean, I think we, we would probably defer to uh, one of the scholars who advised us on the project, Mark Dudley, who has written extensively about this very theme. And I wish he were here to answer it um, because he provides a much more complicated and interesting and uh, nuanced perspective on Hemingway's uh, portrayal of and understanding of the tragedy that had befallen indigenous peoples in this country, and what, what they had lost, what had been taken away, how they had suffered. And, you know, he um, he had the limitations of his uh, time and class and background, but he was not unaware of what had been done um, and did try in different ways to represent it. But, you know, there's going to be many points of view on that for sure. Absolutely. And, and we're just about out of time here. So just one last question that I wanted to ask. After going through the process of putting this film together, um, assumptions that you might have had about Hemingway, were they confirmed or were they challenged? And uh, how did your opinion change about uh, Ernest Hemingway from the beginning of production up until now? Well, that's a very big question that goes to the heart of the journey of both making and I think watching the film. I think, um, for somebody who's as complicated, which is you know a word we all use all the time, but he was truly complicated um, and difficult and often actually pretty unlikable as a human being. Um, his writing um, endures for I think a lot of us who worked on the film, but also you know I sort of thought of Hemingway as a you know brawny drunker who you know I, I knew that he had um, taken his own life, but. I think by the time that happens in the film and people know how it ends, if you know anything about Hemingway, um, it's very sad and tragic because he destroyed himself and suffered from, you know, um, depression and anxiety and all kinds of things. And um, being as famous as he was, um, maybe, and the person that he was didn't get the help that he could have had. And so you're um, While well, you might be ambivalent about him, you're very sad when he dies because it's tragic. Absolutely. And uh, uh, we just got one last question, but I'm guessing you'll be able to answer this pretty quick. Do you have, and it may be difficult, a favorite Hemingway novel or story? Lynn, we'll start with you. What, with who? Me? You, yes. Liz. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. Not difficult, actually. Um, surprisingly, maybe I, I started the project being pretty much sure that A Farewell to Arms was my favorite Hemingway. And at the end of the project, I feel the same way. I have a much deeper appreciation for the work and what went into it and for the um, layers within it of the different kinds of stories he's trying to tell and what he's after there. Mm -hmm. It's the poetry, the way, so the musicality of the language and the combination of that with the portrayal of war, what war is really like and how terrible it is mm -hmm. and what a waste it is, um, the critique of, that kind of hyper-masculine warmongering and all the horrors of it mm -hmm. um, against the backup of the love story and the poetry of the language, it, it's, it, it stands the test of time for me. Uh, Sarah, and for you, do you have a favorite? Well, hammer? we're very boring. We're very boring because we, we both um, always answer this the same way and say that A Farewell to Arms is, you know, our favorite novel. And um, that, that was the same throughout the process of making the film. I think we both read it a number of times while making the film um, and have gone back to it. I will admit that I had not read the short stories before we started working on the film. And all of the writers and all the biographers and everyone we spoke to said, you have to focus on the short stories. The short stories are the most important, even then he read, you know, and, um, and I had not read them. And I, I continue to read them and find interesting things, even in a three page story, no matter how many more times I read it. So I'm, I, I would say a farewell to arms and the, and the short stories for me. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we've been speaking. And, and I will just say that, you know, as a result of the film, Scribner's is putting out a new book, a collection of short stories with some interstitial material from the film and a beautiful essay by Tobias Wolf about 
Hemingway and his relationship to Hemingway. So it's called The Hemingway Stories, and mm. we highly recommend it. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm sure many of our viewers tonight will look into that. Lynn Novick and Sarah Botstein from Florentine Films, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us today and talk about all things Hemingway and Hemingway in Michigan. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. It's really fun. And thank you to Michigan. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you to the Park Library and to Michael. It's wonderful. Thank you. All right. And we definitely want to thank all of you for joining us uh, this evening. And I want to send us a, a sincere thanks to Frank Bowles of the Clark Historical Library and Michael, Fe Michael Fetterspiel for joining us as well. Um, first, one thing that we want to mention very quick before we close, we would love to get uh, your audience feedback on the event tonight. So we are going to put a link to a survey that is going to be copy and pasted into the chat box. Uh, so please, if you can, take a few moments, uh, give us a little bit of feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we also have a few uh, announcements coming up for those of you that are want to know about more Hemingway happenings happening across northern Michigan. Uh, as a part of a year-long Hemingway homecoming celebration, the village of Walloon Lake is hosting a seven-week virtual series called Walloon Lake Reads, the Nick Adams Stories, which kicks off tomorrow, Thursday, April 1st, and runs through mid-May. Also, a Hemingway birthday celebration is planned for July 21st, that's Ernest's birthday, with a handful of family-friendly events, and then Labor Day weekend will be the primary Hemingway homecoming, featuring the unveiling of historical installations in downtown Walloon Lake, focused on Hemingway, as well as other aspects of the village's development and growth at the end of the 19th and early 20th century. And you can learn more about all of those at WalloonLakeMI.com. And of course, we want to make sure that you all tune in Monday, April 5th at 8 p.m. for the premiere of Hemingway on PBS. I think that's all we have. So from everyone, oh, also there will be an archive of this show at wcmu.org slash Hemingway. And also some of the questions that we weren't able to get to this evening that were submitted. We'll see if we can get Michael or Frank to answer those and we'll go ahead and throw those up on the website as well. And that wraps things up for us. So from everyone here at WCMU Public Media, thank you so much for joining us for Hemingway in Michigan. Good night.